Terry, you know, I always like to get up here on the tail end of that applause, right? You know, no, I'm just kidding. Hey, glad to see you in the Lord's house today. Glad you're here. Children's Church is meeting over here to my left, Mr. Bill, Miss Julie. So if any of you youngins would like to go to Children's Church, Kelsey's leading the way there. Please feel free just to come to the Welcome Center and meet Mr. Bill, Miss Julie, and they'll be glad to help you appreciate them serving in Children's Church today. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, uh, if you would find your place with me, your copy of God's Word, if not it'll be on the screen here in just a moment, uh, if you would find 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, we're going to read a few verses there, and dive into some things that I'm calling developments for the last days, with all that's going on in the world today, there's so much concern, and there should be. Good deal. That's all right right there. Good stuff. That's quite all right, sister. That's all right. After about three and a half decades of standing in front of people, you wouldn't believe the things I've seen. I can, <laughs> I can tell you some make you laugh, some make you cry. <laughs> Amen. But that's all good. Hey, I'm just glad you're here. Amen. I'm just glad you took time to be here today to show your commitment and love for the Lord and his word and his people. Just means so much to be able to gather together in the Lord's house. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one. If you found your place and physically able, stand with me if you would. In honor and reverence to the reading of God's word. Second Thessalonians chapter two, verses one through four. Here's what the word of God says. It said, Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter as it is from us as though the day of the Lord has come. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshiped so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Father, in Jesus' name, pray you'd add your blessing to the reading of your word today and help us, Father, to make known the unsearchable riches of your word. Help us to lead people through guidance of your word that they might find a relationship with you and for those who do have a relationship with you that they might be encouraged and inspired to serve you more in these days than at any other time in their life in Jesus name amen and amen thank you you can be seated as I said in light of recent world events my heart has been somewhat burdened to research the word of God and help prepare the church to plead with the world around us concerning events that are still future. How far in the future, we don't know. How close they could be, how far away they could be, we have no certainty. We don't know the days nor the hours, but we can certainly tell that we're in the season. When you read Paul's letters to the church at Thessalonica, you know that, of course, there was a first letter, 1 Thessalonians, five chapters. And in each of those chapters, they end with a reference to the coming of the Lord. It was on Paul's heart, it was on his mind as he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to pen the words of Holy Scripture. He ended each of those chapters with a reference to the coming of the Lord. Of course, we know that the original letter did not have chapter and verse divisions. I know that's shocking to a lot of people in the church today. That came later. But nevertheless, he spoke five times in that first letter about the coming of the Lord. The church at Thessalonica had been a strong force for the gospel in their area. They had a wonderful and a sterling testimony of faithfulness and to evangelism and sharing the word of God. Because of that, they rejoiced in having Paul's teaching there among them. 
They rejoiced that he taught them very clearly in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, beginning in verse 13 through verse 18 in that chapter. He taught them about what it would be like when the Lord Jesus came for his church. And he told them in verse 16 that the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. And we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord shall be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. They got pretty fired up about that, amen? It kind of burdens me that the church today don't get fired up about that, but we should because we're a whole lot closer to that becoming reality than they were. They didn't see it in their lifetime, but they certainly were hoping they would. Between the writing of the first letter to the church of Thessalonica and the second, the people began to have some difficulties. Some became idle because they were like, you know, if he's coming, what's the use in working? What's the use in doing anything? Let's just kind of hang out here and wait for his imminent return. But then there was others that believed they had missed the coming of the Lord and were living in what we know to be as the day of the Lord, which is that time period between the rapture of the church and the revelation of Jesus Christ. Paul writes this second letter to encourage them and also to help correct some false beliefs. Some had been taught, as I said, that they were living in the days of great tribulation. They had missed this meeting in the air and they were quite depressed. They were afraid. They were living in a time of severe anxiety. As I just mentioned a little bit about the second coming of our Lord, we know that it is twofold from Scripture. We know that the first is the rapture of the church which takes place seven years before the revelation of Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 19. There are some who do not believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. There are some who believe in a post-tribulation rapture. There are some who believe in a mid-tribulation rapture, but I'm just gonna hang my hat on that pre-trib stuff, amen? And you know, it's like old Jerry Falwell used to say, he said, I feel sorry for all you folks that believe in a mid-tribulation or a post-tribulation rapture, but when the Lord calls us to meet him in the air, I'm gonna be shouting, I told you so, I told you so, I told you so, all the way to the throne room, amen? <laughs> Regardless of where you're at, I mean, we could split theological hairs. There are four different views to that. One old preacher said one time, he said, well, there are some people who are amillennialists. There are some who are pre-trib and post-trib. He said, I'm just a pan-millennialist. They said, what does that mean? He said, I just believe it'll all pan out, amen? So that's <laughs> a pretty easy way to take it, but... I'm not a pan-millennialist. I, I really believe what I'm preaching to you today is true. These events that we will be talking about today are a part of a big fancy word of study of Bible called eschatology. And I know y'all didn't think I knew words that big, but they taught me over here at Cleveland County High School that any time you hear the word ology, it means to study of. See, I did listen, Scott. Aren't you excited? You signed my diploma, and now you know why, right? I, I learned that much. Ology. Eschatology is the study of, and it's the study of last things. Everyone wants to know what's ahead. They also want to know what they should expect next. Well, I want you to know as best I know how I'm going to walk through this text with you for a little bit today. We're going to spend some time, God willing, in the next few weeks in this chapter to get a clearer picture of what's ahead. I'm speaking to you, as I said today, on the subject of the developments of the last days. And as we look at these first four verses of 2 Thessalonians, the first thing I want you to look at is that this was a picture of some struggling saints. You hear here in these opening verses, verses 1 and 2, how Paul is speaking directly to them. Paul loves them. He cares for them. He's invested in them. He wants to see things go well for them. He wants to see them continue that work of sounding forth the word of God and being faithful to Jesus in all things. So while they were struggling, Paul came alongside them to not just warn them, but he came up beside them to encourage them. See, I tell you, when you're struggling, you need somebody to encourage you, don't you? You need somebody to help you move on through that difficult time and maybe even get completely out of the ditch. That'd be real nice. But Paul knew that they needed both warning 
and encouragement. So as these struggling saints began to deal with the work that they were doing here, the first thing I noticed about them is that they were dealing with some unsettled feelings. Paul reminds them that there's gonna be a great getting up morning. There's gonna be a day when the Lord Jesus Christ is gonna rise from his seat at the right hand of the Father. And, the, uh, and Gabriel will sound forth the trumpet of God and we will be gathered together to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. He wanted to remind them that that event was still coming in the future. They needed to know that. And he said, I pray that you would not be shaken in mind or troubled. What he was saying was, you've got to keep your composure. You've got to keep your spiritual composure during this difficult time. Danny Aiken, the president of Southeastern Seminary, said this about this subject. He said, Satan's battle plan includes two major strategies. One is to exploit our weaknesses and the other is to blind us to God's truth. He said, Satan knows that if he can undermine our belief in what God says, then he can exploit our weaknesses as we struggle to live out our lives in obedience to God. All Satan wants to do is if he can't slow you up, he'll try to cripple you up, he'll try to get you down on yourself, down on the people around you, he'll get you to looking with problems in your job, problems in your home, problems in your church, he'll get you to looking for difficult things that will literally divide you, exploit your weaknesses, and blind you to God's truth. That's his battle plan. But see, we like the Thessalonians must remember we cannot live the emotion-driven life. It's about keeping your spiritual composure to stand. We cannot let our feelings control our behavior because feelings can be very deceptive. See, our faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has the ability to settle our hearts and minds. He has the ability to help us remain focused in living obediently to his word. They were dealing with some unsettled feelings. Maybe you're here today, you've got some unsettled feelings and you're struggling. Well, I want to point you to the Lord Jesus Christ today because he's the only one to bring a settle to your heart and help you through the struggles you face. Well, there's another thing about these struggling saints. I believe also they were dismayed by an uncertain future. We all know what uncertainty is like. We're experiencing that all around us every day. And the fear that had spread among this church apparently was coming from some different sources, Marty. And there were some people, Brother Ray, that were uh, trying to deceive them and they were having a good deal of success. See, that's happening in the church today. Let's walk through this a little bit. The first thing he said about this, and this is not going to be on the screen, but I want you to just follow through verse 2 with me and you can make a few notes. He said, don't be shaken in mind or troubled. Why? Either by spirit, word, or letter as it is from us. Now, like I said, this ain't on the screen, but think about this. The first thing he talked about was by spirit. Now, what does that indicate? That indicates that some form of false teaching had come in the form of utterances in public worship claiming to be given by the Holy Spirit. Now, I know none of you have seen this, and this is probably all new to you, but truthfully, you probably all have seen this. Somebody that just says, you know what? I've got a new revelation from the Lord. It's not in the Bible, and I can't prove it, but I got a revelation from God, and I tell you what, it's from God, and I know it. Don't matter what you say. Don't matter what the Bible says. It's a revelation from God. He's given it to me, and everybody needs to hear it. You know what we need to hear of that? Zero. Because, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to know the primary way that God has chosen to speak to his people in this generation is through the written word of God. And this written, the logos, the logos, the word of God written on the page, if anybody tries to give an utterance or a revelation that does not and cannot be verified by the written word of God, then once again, it's that other Hebrew word, baloney, Amen. And it should not be accepted. But that's what was happening. They were being deceived by these people who said, wait a minute, I've got something and you need to hear it. It's from the Lord and it wasn't. He said also you don't need to be shaken by the word. What word? 
This indicates that there were some lessons taught or some sermons preached that were given to the church by those who were not inspired by the Holy Spirit of God. Imagine that. We don't have to go very far to find that today. Flip on your TV this afternoon and you find some prosperity preacher telling you on TV that if you're right with God, you'll always be wealthy, you'll never be broke, and you'll never be sick. That if you were right with God, you'd be well and wealthy, and the reason that you're broke and sick is because you're not right with God. You know what that person is? A false teacher. Now, let's just call it what it is. But there are people who will go to their, uh, go to their pocketbook and they will write out checks and they will drop it in the mail and send all sorts of millions and billions of dollars around the world to these false prophets who are promising them something that they cannot deliver. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to hear me. From the testimony of the Apostle Paul, we know that it is true you can be 100% right with God. You can be in the center of the will of God and you might get sick, you might be broke and still be right with God. How do I know this? Well, I can see it many times over and over. When Jesus was walking on the earth, he said to the disciples, let's get in that boat and let's pass over to the other side. They got in the boat because Jesus said so. The God man gave them the direction, but even though the Savior was on the boat, it didn't stop the storm from showing up. You say, well, the reason the storm came up is because them boys wasn't right with God. They were doing exactly what God told them to do. Wow. They are listening to the words of false prophets. Well, that brings us to a third thing about these struggling saints is that they were disturbed. Or thirdly, here, you need to write this one down, by letter. What could that mean? Well, evidently, there was a letter that had been delivered. Somebody write me these whole big long letters and forget to sign their name, amen? Tell me all kinds. Now, y'all hadn't done that. I just want you to know, since I've been in Alabama, I know y'all grabbed about me and complained because I know that, but that's because you're people. <laughs> Not you, your neighbor, right? But nobody, I used to, when I was in Georgia, I used to get letters all the time. I mean, just wear me. I mean, it just hurt and break my heart. But I had to learn that they make this thing called a shredder. And I'd just put them in the shredder and I'd say, to God be the glory, hit the button, you know, go. But these boys got a letter and here's what the letter was doing. They were writing the letter claiming that it was from Paul and it wasn't. Paul was denying any responsibility to that letter. And when you take these things together, John MacArthur said this, these words indicate the careful and extensive way that false teaching is presented. They claim to have divine revelation, public proclamation, and the authority of an apostolic writing. Every false teacher claims to have the authority, authority of the word of God backing them, but they have no basis for it. It's very important you understand that. It's almost football time. Anybody fired up? It's just like when you go to football practice. Guys, y'all got practice this week, don't you? When we get some pads on this week, next week, yeah, one more week, okay. But here's what happens. You go to practice and you get lined up, okay? Coach lines you up on offense, lines you up on defense, all right? Let's take defense first. He lines you up on defense and he gets the defensive lineman. The linebackers in the secondary, they call the coverage, they call the alignment based on the way the offense lines up and the coach gets everybody in position, what? To achieve victory and have success. All right, you flip it around on the offense. They get in the huddle, they get the linemen, the tight ends, the wide outs and the backfields and the quarterback. He calls the play, everybody lines up. They line up and they see what the defense has done. Sometimes they do this, they call audibles. I still remember those, I think. And they look at the way they're lined up and they get everybody in position, what to achieve success and victory. But even though your coach can get you lined up in position, 
He can call the right coverage, get the right defensive alignment on offense, get everything lined up in the right play. He can get you in position to succeed, but if you don't execute, you will not achieve victory. All right? I'm your coach here this morning, all right? I want to get you in position to be right with God. I want to get you in position to hear from God. I want to get you in a position to where you can experience spiritual victory. But if you take that Bible home today and you put it on the coffee table and you don't look at it, you don't open it, you don't read it, you don't embrace it, it does not matter how I get you positioned, you will not achieve victory if you don't execute the game plan. Hmm. That's what Paul was saying. I had you in position, but you let the wrong people come in here and tell you what to do. God help us. They were dismayed by an uncertain future. They were disturbed by an unyielding forgery. But I want you to notice something else with me, if you will. Not only do we have struggling saints, but we have days of deception. Well, I just gave you the introduction. Here's where I want to park out, okay? Somebody said, oh my goodness. No, no, hear me for a minute. Do you know why this matters so much to me? Do you know why you matter so much to me? Because I don't want to see you die and go to hell. And if you are a child of God, then I want to see you act like it. I want to see you live like it. And I want to see you experience spiritual victory in your life and not be shaken, not be troubled by every wind of doctrine that swings through this world. There were some days of deception. What does he say in verse 3 and 4? Let's look at these two verses for just a few minutes. Let no one deceive you by any means. He's continuing the thought of verses 1 and 2. For that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Is anybody waiting on that? Is anybody waiting on people to get cool to spiritual things that they used to be hot about? I hope you're not waiting. I, I guarantee you, ladies and gentlemen, I've been experiencing this all of my ministry and I know it went on before my time and people continue and continue to fall away and follow after these false teachers and get pulled into these things and get troubled and shaken in mind. I hope you're not waiting. Unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Wow. Let's talk about, first of all, that falling away. The falling away can also be translated apostasy. If you'll remember when we studied the book of Jude, 25 verses of nothing but candy, corn, cotton candy, and unicorns, right? Oh, no, not the book of Jude. Jude begins writing, and he says, you know what? I desire to write to you concerning our common salvation, but I couldn't because God's in charge of this thing. He said, I wanted to write about our common sense, but I've got to write to you to implore you, to encourage you, to exhort you, to contend for the faith. You know what Jude said the whole time? He said, this thing is going to be a slugfest to the finish. You're going to have to be willing to get down in the trenches of life and slug it out for the glory of God. It's not a real pretty picture in those 25 verses. But he talks about apostasy. In the days where people totally have no thought or regard for God, in the days where right is called wrong and wrong is called right, we're living there, ladies and gentlemen. We're living in days where if you refer to someone in a gender they don't like, that they are, they get mad, get tore up. We're living in the days where you cannot be who you're supposed to be. We're living in a days of political correctness but spiritual wrongness. Wow. We're not really got to wait on that age of apostasy. We're in that. But he talks about the man of misery and I want to spend a few minutes here as we move through and we'll talk more about him as we go through this chapter. We talk about the man of misery. <laughs> We know that the scripture tells us 
and teaches us that the man of sin, the Antichrist, will be revealed the son of perdition, Satan incarnate. Here's what it says about his testimony. He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or is worship so that he sits as God in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Wow. Let's talk about him just for a few minutes. This is not on your screen too but some things you might want to consider. We can read about his attributes and the attributes talks about his father and his family. When you read Revelation chapter 13, verse 1, it teaches us some things about him, it teaches us who he is. We read 2 Thessalonians 2, 9, that he is the beast. He will possess the power of Satan. Adrian Rogers said this about the Antichrist. He said, all the attributes of Satan will be in this man of sin. He will be a consummate liar like his father and perform the works of his father, the devil. In Revelation chapter 13, verse two, it tells us that the beast was like a leopard. His feet were like the bear and his mouth spoke like a lion's mouth. And to understand that, we must go back to our study of Daniel chapter seven where Daniel describes the four great empires of the world as the lion is the royal king of the beast with a massive appetite and incredible strength. Daniel described the next world empire as the Medo-Persian empire as a bear. The bear has incredible strength and powerful claws to crush all of its victims to death. Daniel described the Greek empire thirdly as a leopard because of its rapid movement to conquer the world. And then Daniel saw one more kingdom over which the Antichrist would rule in Daniel 7, 7. Ladies and gentlemen, when the Antichrist comes on the scene, he will come from the family of all four of those empires. He will have the royalty of Babylon, the strength of the Medo-Persian Empire, the sophistication and wisdom of the Greeks, and he will be a combination of Alexander the Great, Napoleon Caesar, Charlemagne, Hitler, and many, many more. He will be the world's worst, most cruel leader that we've ever known. But he doesn't start out that way. You see, after the rapture of the church, the world's going to be plunged into chaos like we've never seen. We think we saw chaos beginning March 2020. We think we've seen some chaos when we just couldn't find toilet paper, which is a problem. I'm not making light of that. But do you realize that was not the biggest problem we could ever have? The world will be plunged into major uncertainty. The world will be in utter chaos and out of these empires will rise this man who seemingly has the answer to all the world's problems. Oh, he'll be handsome, I'm sure. He'll be sharp. He'll be articulate. And he'll have all the gifts that the world thinks they need as such a leader. But in the midst of his reign, he will change. He will no longer be that sophisticated, articulate person. If you notice Revelation 13, 2, it says he would have power and great authority. He will rule with the authority from Satan to rule the world. And you say, can Satan do that? Well, remember Matthew chapter 4. The devil offered all the kingdoms of the world to Jesus, but he didn't take them. But in John 5, 34, Jesus described a man who would accept Satan's offer. He said, I have come in my Father's name and you don't accept me. If someone else comes in my name, you will accept him. Jesus prophesied that the world who would not receive him one day would openly receive the Antichrist. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to hear me. The spirit of Antichrist is already alive and well in our world. The person of the Antichrist could very well be alive today. I don't know and neither do you and neither does anybody else. But I want you to know after the rapture of the church, he's going to unleash hell on this world like this world's never seen. That is why it is so important that I plead with you to come to Jesus now. I know some people say, well, I'll just wait and see. I just want to see if my preacher really knows what he's talking about. I don't think it'll ever get that bad. This can't ever know. He, he's just being a little dramatic. He's being over sensationalistic. I think I'll just wait and see. I want you to hear me. 
Hear me clearly. There is not one jot or tittle of scriptural information that tells us that people who hear the gospel on this side of the rapture will have the opportunity to receive Jesus on the other side. Now, there will be people who will be saved. I believe that. The 144,000 witnesses, I can sit down here and talk with you about it all day long. I do believe people will come. I believe there will be that. But I want you to know if you're hearing about it on this side, don't you think for a moment that you can just bank on what happens on the other side. You are being extended grace right now to come to the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You are being extended grace in this day in the church age to come to Christ right where you are right now and just freely submit yourself to him and receive the free gift of salvation while the church cheers you on. But you want somebody to believe that if you won't come to Jesus when folks will cheer for you that someday you'll miraculously find the strength to come to Jesus when they're going to kill you. I just don't believe that. I believe that now is a day of salvation. Let me finish talking about his ambitions and we'll move on. It says he opposes, exalts himself above all that's called God. This is a very, this guy right here this is the narcissist of all narcissists. This is a guy who I'm sure will be taking selfies by the millions and have more chat snap followers and have more Twitter followers. It's kind of like people like, man, I got all kinds of friends. How many friends you got? Well, I got 3,500 Facebook friends. Can I tell you something? That does not mean you got a lot of friends. <laughs> His ambition is he's coming to defy the Savior he's coming to destroy the saints but I got some good news for you I read the back of the book okay I know what I've had to share with you today is not a whole lot of good news but can I leave you with some good news would that be alright somebody please say amen alright just checking cause y'all be zoned out on me or like I don't want to hear no more of that but Here's what I read toward the back of the book. Just flip over a little bit there, Revelation 19, okay? Just flip. I'm going to give you a minute. You need to look at this, okay? You don't need to just trust me. You need to look at this on the page. Because here's the good news. John the Revelator, 90-something years old, exiled out on the Isle of Patmos thinking that God has just put him out there to die, but God has put him out there to have his total attention and uses him to write his greatest work. Amen? Revelation 19, 11. Look here. Here's what he saw. Now I saw heaven open. I like that. Amen? And behold a white horse. He that sat on him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. Somebody say read on preacher. Read on. All right, stay with me now. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with robe dipped in blood straight from Calvary. And his name is called the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as the only begotten of the Father full of grace and truth. Reckon who this is. Verse 14 and the armies in heaven clothed in fine linen and white horses and white and clean followed him on white horses. Hey, church, that's us. Hey, it ain't gonna be like them little old Shetland ponies they used to put me on and throw me off and bite me and all that. Come on, boy, get back on that horse. No, 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 no. This one right here is gonna know how to do it, amen? Oh, look here. Hey, look here. They said they followed him on white horses. Verse 15, now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword 
and that with it he should strike the nations and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fiercest and the wrath of almighty God and he has on his robe uh, and on his thigh a name written King of Kings. Lord of Lords. Hey, you know why I'm not too tore up about who the Antichrist is? It's because I got a relationship with the authentic Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, when you understand what it means to walk with the authentic Son of God and walk with Him and talk with Him and He speaks with you and directs your life through the person of the Holy Spirit that dwells inside you as a believer, I'm telling you right now, you can look at this world and you can say it looks real bad, but you can look up and say one day the heavens are gonna open and I'm gonna meet Him in the air and I'm gonna come back on a white horse and I'm gonna watch Him rule the nations with a rod of iron. Woo! Glory to God! Glory to God! When you know the authentic Christ, church, that's what we need to be all about. We need to be about the authentic Christ. And we need to use every avenue, every tool we have to get the message of Jesus to a hurting world. Friend, listen. He loves you. He died for you. He got up from the dead for you. He's ascended to the Father and he's interceding for his children. Someday he's coming back. I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Neither do you. Neither does the false prophet on TV. When I was a senior in high school, there was a guy who wrote a book called 88 Reasons Why Jesus is Coming Back in 1988. September 11, 1988, Sunday morning. Now, you know what I did on that Sunday morning? I got up, Marty. I was a 17-year-old kid. I had a preaching appointment that Sunday. I went off to a little old church down in Clay County, Ray, and I opened the Bible as best I knew how. I just poured my heart out to those folks. I went on about my business. Later that evening, the guy who predicted that the Lord was coming back about 10 o'clock that morning realized he had got his calculations off just a little bit. He said, it's tomorrow. So I thought, hey, Monday morning, that'd be great. Miss school. <laughs> I was all for that. Don't listen to that, kids. You don't need to hear that. But you know what? Went to school Monday. I said, I hope so. They'd be like, well, what if you don't? I said, I'll look for him tomorrow. And what if he don't come next? I'll look for him next day. There were people worried to death about it. Hear me? When you know the authentic Christ, here's how you live. When peace like a river attendeth my way. When sorrow like sea billows roll. Whatever my lot, he has taught me to say. It is well. It is well with my soul. But here's what I'm concerned about and I'm done. Is it well with your soul? Do you know the authentic Christ? Have you put off the decision to trust him because you want to sow your wild oats or have a big time or something? Have you put that off because it's just not a convenient season for you? Are you worried? Watch it. No, no. Brian, I have to give up so much if I really surrender to Jesus. No, no, here's what you'll give up, okay? Eternity in hell. That's all you'll give up. Well, what about, he changes you want to's. He changes where you go. He changes where you hang out. He changes the way you talk, changes the way you walk. He changes everything about you because when he comes in, it's a transformation. It ain't just a remodel, man. He comes in and takes studs out. He starts over. Come to Jesus today. And if you are a follower of Jesus, I pray that your walk with him would be even deeper, stronger. Because I saw something a while back I believe is true. Someone shared this with me. said, in the days we're living in, you better find you a Bible preaching church and get in it. Because in the days ahead, you're going to need it. I like that. 
you're going to need a Bible preaching church you're going to need a God loving family around you and you're going to need a relationship with the son of God who will take you in eternity pray with me Father in Jesus name Father, I never pretend to know the needs of the people that are in this building today or those that would be watching online. Father, you know that I never pretend to have any insight into that. But Father, I know your heart. I know what your word teaches us, that where I am limited, you are unlimited. And Father, you know the needs out here. You know the needs across the internet into the homes that are watching today you know the needs all around us Father I'm just praying today that those in this room or those watching my internet that don't know you that today right now at this gospel invitation would just trust you and just make the very best decision they'll ever make to receive you as personal Lord and Savior. And Father, for your people, your children, they'd make the best decisions that they could make in their Christian life is just fall more in love with you every day. Get more concerned about what's on your agenda instead of ours. And Father, that you'd break our hearts for the things that breaks yours. Father, today... I know you want to change somebody's life. I know you want to continue to mold this church into a great commission church. One that worships without any shame and unashamedly proclaims the name of Jesus wherever we go and is on mission with you across the street and around the world. Father, mold this church into what you want it to be and not me and not us your son went to the cross to purchase the church you own it not us use it for your glory in Jesus name amen and amen let's stand our feet all across the house before Marty begins to lead us I want you to look this way just a minute the word I've shared with you today yes it is a word of warning but I pray you also see it as a word of encouragement to encourage you to come to Jesus encourage you to give your everything for his glory if you're here today and you're not a Christian look here this preacher didn't come to throw rocks at you today no 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 I did come to throw a rope to you though and that rope is a lifeline of the blood of Jesus it's the only way to cleanse you of your sin I invite you on the very first word, the very first verse, that you just step into that nearest aisle. I'd be glad to meet you here and help you get a hold of heaven today. You leave here a transformed child of God. Church, what about us? Are we letting God continue to work us and move us and change us from glory to glory every day? Are we waking every day saying, God, this is all about you. Use us for your glory. Are we giving him 100% control or do we kind of want to take the will until things get out of hand? Maybe it's a day at church we just find a place in an altar and say, God, our days are short. We're excited that we're going to be with you soon. We sure are concerned about those that aren't ready. Give us a burden for reaching them before it's everlasting too late. If you're here today and you're a child of God, you believe this is the place God would choose for you and your family to serve the Lord, we'd invite you to come on this verse also, okay? Marty, lead us when you're ready. Friend, come to Jesus. If you are tired of the load of your sin, let Jesus come into your heart.
There's some sheets back here, Glenn, I think, from our nominating team. Uh, I want to ask y'all if y'all would just to come through the aisles there and hand those out. Our nominating team needs a little help from you this year and what these uh, uh, surveys are, and you'll all get one. Uh, if you would, take a moment. I believe every member ought to be involved in the ministry, don't you? I mean, and so there's a place for everybody. And sometimes we don't always know well, you know, what is a place of service you feel is where you're gifted or you could best serve the Lord? And we want to use this survey, if you would, to just provide that help to our nominating team who's doing a wonderful job as always. I'm very thankful for what they're doing. But it helps them in preparing to uh, get that report ready by knowing, hey, you know, because some of you, uh, you may not like trimming bushes or something. Just kidding, nobody has to trim bushes. We pay for that. But anyhow, I don't know about y'all, but I love cutting grass. I don't mind weed eating. I don't mind blowing leaves. But I just don't like trimming hedges, don't you? And you know what happened? The, the 11 years I lived in Taylorsville, Georgia, I had holly bushes. Do you know those are going to grow all over hell? I just, I mean, holly bushes. I mean, you might like holly bushes. And if you like holly bushes, somebody else is cutting them and picking them up. That's all I know, all right? But those holly bushes weren't me, Keith. They weren't me on hedges. Now, I got some, though. I got some crepe myrtles over at the house. Every winter, I just chop them dogs down to nothing, right? And then, you know what they do? Just come right back. I feel like a master gardener. But some of this other stuff is terrible. I'm not very good. So anyhow, there may be things you feel that you could best be used for. And if you just fill that out, and as you get done here today, and just take a moment to do that, uh, and just leave that with us either at the Welcome Center or the back door. We'll pass that information on to our nominating team, and that will help them uh, a whole lot. So thank you for taking time to do that, okay? All right, guys, our ushers, are we ready? Uh, they're deliberating, they're deliberating, they're taking up an offering in the back. Okay, y'all come ahead, brothers, if you would. And we're going to receive our morning. Hey, let's give faithful today. We need to finish this month strong. We had a few extra expenses and stuff. We're replacing our doors and things like that. And that, but that's just stuff you got to do, amen? And I tell you, it just means so much each and every week to just, just know that we can trust God, that we can't outgive him, we can't, you know, can't live without him. And we're just grateful for all he does. So give faithfully. Let's finish July strong, headed into August, and just believe God's going to give us a great uh, harvest, that God's going to give us a great opportunity of sharing the gospel and a great opportunity for ministry in the future. So let's bow our heads together and ask God's blessings on our giving. And Father, we come to you, Lord, thanking you for the message that we heard today. Lord, uh, help us to live with urgency, Lord, because you are coming. Lord, I know you're coming because your word tells me so. Lord, it breaks my heart that this altar is not full, that these people are not moving to uh, change their lives, Lord, to follow you. Lord, the way we know who the Antichrist is,
is, is by knowing you better. Lord, when we know the authentic Christ in and out, Lord, the, the fake is easy to spot. So, Lord, to help us to be about your business. Help us to be studying about you. Help us to be learning more about you. Help us to be working in your name in every area of our life. And, Lord, help us to start today. Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we take this offering. Lord, that you would help this give us wisdom, Lord, to use it in a way that glorifies you and in a way that maximizes your kingdom. Lord, because everything we do is about you and not about us. Lord, again, we thank you for sending Brent to us. Lord, we thank you for his family. We pray that you'd bless them and watch over them. And, Lord, just give them peace and protection. And, Lord, just be with us as we go throughout the rest of this day. And all these things we ask in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. remain one other uh, ministry opportunity I forgot to mention they had it written down it wasn't in your bulletin but we've got an opportunity to do some clean up some pressure washing work at Fruithurst this week we're working on a day but if you would uh, be interested where's Mark at I lost him didn't I? I done lost him he went somewhere anyhow if you would just uh, catch me out back there and you say hey I've got some time I might be able to help a little while it's about a half a day deal trying to help them out there and I know you think, man, I preach, you put a lot of emphasis, I'll tell you why. Because I want the people in this community, when they turn around, they're stepping over the people at Heflin Baptist trying to serve them. Amen? I really am. I really want that. And I want them to know that there is a pastor and people that don't just reside at 155 Almond Street. They get outside them walls and they go show it. Amen? They don't just talk it. It's easy to talk it. We've got to walk it. So if you would... Uh, uh, be interested any of those opportunities I hope you turn those in it's just a great thing it, it feels good to serve others with nothing expected in return doesn't it, it really does now, I want to leave you with this today take this take your Bible if you don't have one you see me I will get you one and you take this Bible and you put your nose in it every day and you read it and you study let me tell you why You've heard me share before that the way they train people at the U.S. Treasury to be able to know and spot counterfeit money is not by studying counterfeits, not antichrist, not anti-money. They train them by becoming so familiar with the authentic that any slight deviation, they can spot a fake, a fraud, or counterfeit. So get so familiar with the authentic Son of God that when you hear something in the news, read something in the paper, if they still print it, I don't know. It's a different world we live in today, isn't it? But regardless, you would be so in love and so familiar with Jesus that whenever the counterfeits show up, you can spot them real fast. It'll help you not be shaken. It'll keep you from being troubled in these difficult days. And church, don't ever forget this. You know God loves you. Don't ever forget that I love you too. And there's nothing.
nothing you can do about it. Amen. Let's stand together. Marty's going to sing us out. I want you to have a great Sunday afternoon. I'll catch you out front there.